Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Laube, our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche in hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. Hello, my name is Laura Farnenbroek and I work at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I am an historian for German history and my expertise is on the Second World War and military history. I obtained my PhD with the study on German soldiers and their sexual relationships with Dutch women. This was a study on the daily life of German soldiers in the Netherlands and ever since I have had a strong interest in historical sources other than those with governmental origins. My interest lies more in the experiences of the people in the past, such as those that we can investigate in historical letters. I got involved with the letters of Hilda and Roland about two years ago when I met Andrew Bergeson at a conference in Europe and I got to know a lot about our protagonist while being a blogger in the Trukenschein project. What can Hilde and Roland's love letters tell us about the past? Their letters are a constant reaffirmation and witnessing of their love for one another and can justifiably be designated as love letters. But they are just as much a testimony about everyday life in Germany under Nazi rule. This statement may seem surprising at first glance. Such letters invoke love and togetherness. In them, lovers constantly reinvent themselves as individuals and a couple. One might very well ask how such documents could inform us about everyday life in the Nazi dictatorship. One might also wonder which topics ordinary people could discuss in their letters in light of surveillance, censorship and self-censorship. In fact, historians and literary critics have shown that love letters possess a double nature that includes both artistic stylings along with reports about the everyday. Hill and Roland's letters exemplify quite well this nexus of self-stylings, aestheticizations, working on the relationships and dealing with the ordinary matters of daily life. This dialogue of lovers was, in the context of Nazi rule, closely associated with the experience of escalating violence in many forms. In this lecture, I want to guide you through three aspects we have to address in order to understand more of the context of the love letters of this play. First, I will introduce to you our protagonists, Hilde Lauber and Roland Nordhoff. I will talk about their social backgrounds, how they have met and fell in love with each other, and what it meant to be in love with a person from another village, region, class and age, and in Germany before and during war. 
After that, I will also address Hilda and Roland's correspondence more directly as a whole collection and in terms of the material qualities of this letter, of the letters, excuse me. I would like to share with you some of the challenges and the opportunities for scholarly work with the letters and I will do so with the help of the highly valued expertise of my colleague Dr. Christina Hartig. Christina Hartig is an experienced scholar in the field of letters from the period of the National Socialism. In 2007, she published an article in the Leo Beck yearbook titled Conversations about taking our own lives. Oh, a poor expression for a force deep in hopeless circumstances. Suicide among German Jews, 1933-1943. to Furthermore, in her dissertation, she analyzed the changes in gender relations and generational relations in Jewish families in the Third Reich. The study was also based on correspondence. More recently, Christina was supervising a project at the University of Hamburg about what love letters can teach us about National Socialism. Currently, she works at the University of Ulm. So, Christina and I will discuss the value of Hilde and Roland's letters for historians and therefore we will talk about correspondence as a social practice. That means that we would like to elaborate on the double nature of love letters that allows us to say a lot about the history of everyday life in the Nazi period. And finally, we will say something about propaganda and censorship in the Nazi dictatorship in order to understand some of the limits of letters as historical sources. Let me introduce to you Hilde and Roland Nordhoff. You can see them here on a picture when they were just married and Hilde visited her husband at basic training. Only a few weeks after they married in July 1940, Roland got the call to fulfill his duty for the German Wehrmacht, the Fatherland, and was drafted. Since September 1939, Nazi Germany was at war with half of Europe and every man between 16 and 44, and later also women, had to serve the army. That meant that the newlyweds had to begin their marriage by writing letters, sending parcels and waiting for his holidays from service. And, of course, always hoping that the connection by letters would last and Roland would be spared from dangerous missions at the front. Let me bring you to the southeastern part of Germany. Here you see Saxony, where our protagonists both came from. Saxony was very well known for its beautiful capital Dresden, also called Florence on the River Elbe, because of its richness of art collections and architecture. But Hilde and Roland both were not from Dresden, but born in rural areas of Saxony. Mountains and deep woods, as well as the River Elbe, were the settings for the villages most Saxons lived in during the beginning of the 20th century. Hilda Nordhoff, born Laube, was 13 years younger than the man she picked to be her husband. Her parents were not very happy at first, but since she was the only child and very persistent, and also because Roland asked her parents in a traditional and very polite way to be allowed to meet Hilda after some time of secret correspondence, Hilda's parents approved of the contact between her daughter and the lower school teacher. Hilda's father was a World War I veteran and worked in a local factory for part-time. And also Hilda was a worker in the local clothing factory when she met Roland. Born from a working-class family, Hilda left school after the eighth grade. She began her working life in the early years of Nazi rule, which were comparatively stable economically and improved life for the Germans who belonged to the Nazi Volksgemeinschaft. Even though Hilde had her own source of income, her family's lack of resources prevented her from pursuing her desired career as an infant nurse or kindergarten teacher. She was the initiative person in their courtship from day one. She was the one who began the correspondence by confessing her secret affection to Roland and requesting a rendezvous after Roland had to leave Hill's town for another school to work at. The much older school teacher Roland was born into a bourgeois family, which was quite a different background from Hilda's. 
They belonged to spheres that did not mix automatically or frequently. But um, in this case they did at the local church in the choir. Roland was not at all happy when he was drafted by the German army, but he believed in fulfilling his duty for the fatherland, and he quickly adapted to the tone and the atmosphere among his comrades by looking for niches in the nature and in his letters to Hilda. This helped him to accommodate to the situation in basic training and later on in Bulgaria, Greece and Romania. Just six weeks after their wedding, Roland moved to the northern parts of Germany in order to follow his basic military training. From that time, the couple exchanged letters on a more regular basis, even daily, to keep in touch and to get to know each other more deeply in the young relationship as husband and wife. Through the letters, they became more open and explicit about this feel their feelings, desires and hopes for the future. They created their own cosmos as a couple, a couple cosmos, that seemed to bridge their different backgrounds very successfully. It is very obvious in the letters that the couple shared warm feelings about the region they came from. Even, even though they grew up in different parts of rural Saxony, Roland grew up in the hilly parts of eastern Saxony, close to the capital, while Hilda was born in the wider and western parts, they shared an understanding of us Saxons more than they thought of us Germans. Well, they identified with the German language and culture. For example, Roland taught Hilda old classics and Hilda taught Roland modern cultural products. But when they talked about home, the so-called Heimat, they meant the mountains and the forests of Saxony and not so much the Northern Sea or the Alps. Hilda was quite relieved when she learned that Roland was together in basic training with men from Saxony because she believed that he would feel a bit more like home then. The Wehrmacht did this on purpose, to keep together peer groups from the same region, because this kind of relationships to regions and locality had a tradition since German nation was unified some 60-70 years before, and the identification with the local characteristics of a certain region went hand in hand with identification with a newly invented nation. We can find this shared love to the nature and the people in Saxony throughout Hilde and Roland's correspondence, just as we can find their belief in God. The couple knew each other from the local choir of the Lutheran church in Hilde's hometown, and, it's, and it is therefore understandable that the church physically played a role in their relationship and became an important place for them. And both were also very religious. To believe in God also meant to believe in the rightness of their God-given, unique love relationship, and it meant to believe in the rightness of everything that happened, including what would happen in the future. Throughout the correspondence, we can read a never-ending belief in the fate that God had chosen for them. The correspondence of Roland and Hilde has been well preserved in private hands in Germany. It consists of 24 folders of letters of various lengths. Hilde and Roland began to exchange letters in May 1938 and continued until February 1946. That is, the correspondence continued throughout the Third Reich, the total war and the early years of the occupation. At the beginning of their courtship, they wrote once or twice a week. During the war, however, they sometimes exchanged multiple letters a day. The letters have all been written by hand. Hilda's handwriting was in many ways similar to the one we use today because she was younger. But Roland, by contrast, wrote his letters in old German script. Its pointy angles are noticeably different from the rounder, more modern script. For many readers today, this old German script is hardly legible. Like many writers of love letters, Roland and Hilde developed a relationship-specific language that allowed them to express their love in symbols and concepts that only they understood. The number 13, for instance, stood for their love. A long series of exclamation points, as many as 13, underscored their feelings in the way 
that people today might use emojis to express their emotions in a text. Especially in the later letters, they wrote in a smaller script when they described their physical desires. Above all, they disguised their feelings in a symbolic language of secret gardens and fountains to which only they had access. We can thus expand our understanding of the Third Reich not only through the content of these letters but also because of the unique ways they were written. They direct our attention to the inside of Nazi politics. They show us how the major developments and ruptures of modern German and world history were experienced by people on the ground. And they show us how ordinary Germans appropriated the policies and principles of National Socialism as historians of everyday life describe this process, with the result that Nazi rule was able to pen penetrate deeply into German society. For a long period, letters were the only way that Roland and Hilde were able to communicate. The main themes of the letters are their courtship, their engagement and the first years of their marriage. At the same time, the act of writing also shaped the way they viewed themselves and each other. Here we cannot divorce the way that Hilde and Roland described themselves as a couple from the way they inscribed the future into Nazi Germany. They were, like many of the Germans who were not directly affected by persecution and exclusion, in that they saw in the policies of the Nazi regime a promise for more social equality and economic growth. In a letter to Roland on 15th of July 1938, Hilde wrote about this hope in relation to how she imagined her future partner in marriage. Because Hilde came from a working class family, her mother feared her associating with Roland, who belonged to the higher social stratum, but Hilde did not. She had this to say about her mother. I don't know, she is so unassuming, she yields to her fate and never dares to demand anything from life. But I say, why should we always stand modestly in the background, even if we are less well off, waiting until fate may just be merciful to us for one day in our life, bringing the realization of our desires? These views are old-fashioned to me. In our era, it is different. It is not one's background that is decisive, but one's heart, inclinations, and a clear understanding of the truth. After all, we all have the right to be happy. And if we feel the courage and the power to change our fate by our own volition, who can prevent us from doing so? But how was Hilde supposed to master the challenges that came with these dreams? In her letters she repeatedly refers to her lack of education, her inexperience in running a middle-class household, and her concern that she would not be equal to the task of polite conversation with the middle classes. The historical conditions for developing her skills as a mother and housewife were not ideal, she realized. It was not just that the war was beginning and Germans were being mobilized for it, which meant, for instance, that Hilde felt social and political pressure to volunteer for the government and the Nazi labor service. Gender and sexual norms were also rapidly changing, a fact that was evident even in how Hilde behaved as compared to Roland, who was 13 years older than her. Writing these letters helped Hilde, the daughter of a laborer, to deal with these challenges. At the same time, however, Hilde did not just subordinate herself to the norms. The Nazi regime was busy loading Aryan women who took charge of the household and produced healthy Aryan babies. Later on, in Lecture 3, you will hear more about the way Nazi propaganda addressed gender roles. Yet Hilde latched onto this propaganda to help convince herself and her mother that she could run her own household, even as the wife of a middle-class man. She wrote about marriage as a commitment, sacrifice and duty. She reported proudly, proudly 
that she is perfect at laundry and will soon master ironing. Roland recommended Nobel's poetry and plays for Hilda to read and instructed her about how to maintain the proper proximity and distance when interacting socially with other people. A quick study, Hilda then applied these new skills with success. She used her new role as future wife of a teacher as a way to avoid labor service as mandated by the Nazi regime. She similarly called back on this role whenever it suited her interests and desires. For instance, she claimed the right to avoid having, the, having to volunteer for labor service by saying that she was the wife of a teacher to serve as a group leader for small children. You may ask yourselves, as many historians have done, whether people will produce or transform these gender norms by appropriating them in this way. Historians estimated that some 40 billion letters were exchanged between the home and war fronts during Second World War. In these letters, love, politics and war were entangled in each another and in the daily lives of the letter writers. Viewed in this way, letters did not contrive a private refuge in which lovers or anyone else could insulate themselves from the Third Reich. Letter writing was part and parcel of the social practices that bound individual life plans to political objectives. The letters make clear that, for a long time, Hilde and Roland, like many ordinary Germans, saw a better future for themselves, for their relationship and for their prospects in the Third Reich. In this, their experience as people who belonged to the Nazi Fourth Gemeinschaft was quite different from those who were persecuted by it. Leading Nazi figures recognized that letters could not only strengthen the relationship of the lovers, but also connect their fate directly to the success of the Nazi regime. Measures were taken even before the start of the war to guarantee the efficient exchange of mail. The quick and free delivery of military mail was designed to reinforce the bonds of friendship and family. As an example, the military mail required in 1942 only a few days reaching Paris or Copenhagen, and even on the hard-fought Eastern Front, contact with the home front was seldom disrupted. Though it's true that it could take up to two weeks for letters to arrive by that point in the war. Only at the end of the war Germans did experience long-term interruptions in their letter traffic. Still, the Nazi regime developed specific commandments, norms and values for letters to and from the front. Already during, already during the First World War, women were encouraged to send cheerful Sunday letters to their husband, fathers and brothers on the front. This requirement was valid also for the Second World War. Women were supposed to support and cheer up the soldiers. In this situation, the demands of the government and the aspirations of the people coexisted well together. The wish to bring some joy to one's loved ones in hard times was not only desirable for a military perspective, but also a normal part of everyday communication. This example illustrates that Nazi propaganda could often attach itself seemingly seamlessly to existing practices. Letters are not transparent windows into the past, however. We also have to consider whether the letter writers may not have expressed their thoughts and feelings completely and the possible reasons why. Especially in the Nazi era, one major cause was the various forms of censorship. Surveillance was implemented on domestic mail and directed mostly against the political enemies of the Nazi regime, actual or suspected ones. Once the war began, the foreign mail was also monitored. The purpose was to prevent illegal foreign exchange transactions as well as the transmission of military useful information. Furthermore, there was an independent monitoring of the military mail. Here too, the primary goal was to prevent the disclosure of militarily relevant information 
but there was a secondary purpose of forestalling the spread of negative influences between the war and home front. In the latter case, the punishments could be drastic. Between 30 and 40,000 people were convicted for undermining the armed forces. Many were condemned to death. In spite of these surveillance measures, however, the large volume of letters led de facto to the fact that only a small number of actual letters were opened. Letter writers at the time knew this, thanks to the fact that, unlike the Gestapo, the authorities reading the military mail marked the letters that they did open with a stamp. But because individuals could not predict whether the letters would be checked, they all had to carefully consider the expected norms for behavior and interaction in anticipation of a potential inspection. Along with the governmental censors, Rolands and Hill's personal environments also played a role in shaping what they wrote and what they did not write. At first, they wanted to keep their courtship secret from the prying eyes of neighbors, including the postman. Especially in a small town, information about who received how many letters, from where and from whom, could quickly present a potential danger for private and political secrets. Especially when it came to letters from the front, as the circle of additional people who might be reading the letter extended beyond censor and surveillance authorities. These letters were not just read by the person to whom they were addressed, but were often passed to other relatives, to friends and others, and parts of letters were also read out loud. You might think that a love letter was only their private business, but in war, this presumed private sphere was often broken in order to reassure friends and family that the person they loved was still alive. One possible way to avoid surveillance or censorship was to tailor your own letter to meet the expectations of potential outside readers through some form of self-censorship. It did not take place solely in terms of politics and war. Social conventions relating to sexual taboos, for instance, also played a role in limiting the kinds of things that Germans included in their letters. But in many cases, these kinds of self-restraint were obstructed by the burning need to open up to the other person and share your worries. For this reason, many people wrote remarkably openly about their experiences, fears and desires in spite of surveillance and censorship. And since we see Roland here on the picture with his comrades, it's worth mentioning that he distanced himself from his comrades as being the letter-writing type of man with a very special kind of love relation with his wives, but at the same time, he shared his worries about delay of letters and he shared goods like homemade cake that Hilda had sent to us, her husband to the front. And in that sense, the letters were not only able to shape Roland's self-image, but also his bonds with the comrades he had to deal with very closely every day in a difficult phase of his life. So these were the points I wanted to share with you. Rest me to say that I thank you for the, um, the interest in our lecture and I wish you a fruitful and enjoyable play.